Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking another look at uh, Patent 1907 bayonets and um, more specifically, the Australian issue and manufacture of these bayonets throughout the First World War and the interwar period leading up to the Second World War. Now if you're not familiar with these, uh, they're manufactured to fit the uh, short magazine Lee Enfeld rifle, the number one Mark III rifle. And um, they were made by, well, a number of companies around the world, but uh, for the purpose of this video for Australian issue, there were a couple of companies in the UK and Lithgow here in Australia that uh, manufactured them. So um, pre-World War I, uh, thousands of rifles and um, bayonets were purchased by the Australian government. And uh, the bayonets that you'll find purchased from the UK uh, generally come from Enfield, Wilkinson, Sanderson, and then you also find a couple by Moll and Chapman. I uh, haven't seen any made by Vickers and Remington yet, but I won't rule it out as impossible. Now, in 1912, um, the Australian government purchased uh, machinery from uh, Pratt & Whitney in the US. Um, prior to the machinery coming over to Australia, a couple of rifles and bayonets were made, and you can come across um, a couple of those. Generally, they will have their own unique uh, stamping on the pommel. I think it's a C with a broad arrow above it, and uh, those are quite rare and fetch quite the price. I've never come across one personally, but I've read uh, <laughs> a couple of blogs where there's a couple of collectors out there who've got them, those lucky pricks. Uh, anyway, 1912, machinery's brought down here. Uh, small arms factory uh, at Lithgow starts production, and in 1913, the first rifles and bayonets are completed. Um, not many were uh, delivered in 1913, you got to remember this is also prior to the First World War, so as of yet there isn't a huge need for production. And Australia already has a fair few rifles and bayonets purchased from the UK. But um, 1913, first uh, couple are uh, manufactured, and um, these early ones still have uh, hooked quillins like we have here. So while um, the UK deleted and discontinued the hook quillin in, I think, 1913 or 1912, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, Lithgow continued manufacturing them through until 1915. And um, Lithgow production of bayonets picked up throughout the First World War and uh, continued on uh, after the war, um, into the interwar period, although in a reduced capacity from the late 20s uh, through until um, probably the early 1940s or late 1930s. It's a bit unclear. So it's a little unclear as to um, how many were actually produced in the interwar period. Uh, some sources will say only a couple hundred per year, three to five hundred per year. Some sources will say a couple thousand. Uh, some sources will say between 1927 and 1938, none. Um, based on what I've read and uh, serial numbers of, not serial numbers, but the numbers of them that I've seen, I'm of the opinion that up until about 1929, there was still a couple thousand being made per year. And then production dropped down but did not stop. So it might have dropped down to a couple hundred rifles per year and bayonets per year, but uh, just enough to maintain the capability. And then in the um, late 30s, production started up in a big way, and by the Second World War, they were uh, very ready to continue production. Um, I have seen a couple made between like uh, 1927 and 1938. Um, I'll chuck a couple photos up, see if I can find any photos after I make this video. But uh, I'm lucky enough to have a 1927 just here. And from what I've read, there weren't too many 27s made, probably only a couple thousands, if that. Uh, anyway, that's um, a little bit of history. Uh, I've got another video on these for um, Australian uh, production during World War II. So watch that if you want to know uh, what happens after that. But uh, jumping into the actual construction, P1907s, they're no different to you know any other P1907. Um, originally a rip-off of the uh, Japanese Type 30 bayonet, nice long blade, one edge, no false edge, uh, fuller, cross guard, uh, early ones hook quillins, yeah. Everyone's pretty familiar with these, I don't need to explain them too much. The only construction I do really need to get into is the early Australian ones, early Lithgow production, had the teardrop style on uh, of uh, stud on their scabbards and from there they went to a little uh, circular stud i don't have an example of that 
And then I believe sometime in the 1920s, they adopted these big circular studs. So that's the only construction I'll really get into. I think the main focus of this video is probably going to be the markings. And um, I'll break that into two little sections. So you've got the original uh, UK ones and then the Lithgo ones. The Lithgo ones really had a bit of variation to their markings. Um, going through the interwar period, there were a couple of changes. And um, because they do fetch quite a high price, particularly if they've still got a hook quillin, a lot of people do fake them. So hopefully I can help you spot a fake. Uh, there have been a couple on eBay recently, which is but a bit disappointing. I don't know if perhaps they were um, mocked up by collectors who just wanted something to resemble it and then sold by someone else who didn't know. I like to think it wasn't intentional, but um, unfortunately there are a few uh, dodgy ones getting around. But anyway, I'll start with the, uh, the UK issued ones here. So you've probably seen this one before. I don't think I've shown you this one. So I'll pop it out. From memory, they're both Enfeld. Yep, that's an Enfeld as well. I'll bring the Ricasso in so you can have a look. Now the marking, come on, focus please. The markings to a regular P1907 uh, on the pattern side are the same. You've got your, come on, your crown, your Royal Cipher. You've got your um, pattern, pattern 1907. Your manufacturer in a date and year, and then your manufacturer underneath being EFD Enfield. So I'm constantly refocusing my camera here. This is shocking. Then on the reverse, we have all our inspection marks, our X indicating it passed the bend test, and the markings on the cross guard are what makes this Australian. Now, come on, focus, please. So on the left, we have what's called an MD number or military district number. And that's a number that sort of, the military districts are broken down into states in Australia. And uh, each state is assigned a number and that number is, um, well, it's a military district number. It's also their postcode number. It's also their telephone number. So it's just the, the number specific to a state. Now, this one here, you can't see it anymore. It's worn off. I've actually done a uh, magnetic particle inspection on this, which is a serial number. Uh, it's technically a serial number restoration, although I haven't done any restoration. It just allows you to see a serial number without damaging it. And I was able to tell that this one is a 2, 2MD. Two and uh, 2 is the military district for uh, New South Wales. That's the state I'm in here in Sydney. And then next to that, we just have a serial number. So both of these two markings are the markings that are um, placed on two uh, bayonets when they were entered into service here in Australia. Now I'll pop that one down. There's a number of other different kinds of markings you can get. This one has the same, just a lot clearer. Instead of 2MD, this one has 2nd MD. That's also pretty typical. There's a whole bunch of different um, markings you can come across. You can come across a D with a broad arrow in it. You can come across just a broad arrow. You can come across uh, capital D, broad arrow, capital D. And then uh, you might even have the capital D, broad arrow, capital D with the military district number in the middle. Or you might just have a military district number by itself like I have here, five. So nothing terribly exciting about that one. So that's generally what you'll find on your... Uh, British ones, sorry, these two are British, uh, that um, have been entered into Australian service. They'll have Department of Defence markings on them and a military district number. They might also have uh, Department of Defence markings on the pommel. That's where you usually find a big D with a broad arrow in it. But I'll move these two out of the way because they're my two British ones. And we'll focus on what we have left here, being our three Lithgow manufacturer. Now, I've got some um, images here to sort of uh, help me depict the uh, the markings you find on your early P1907s uh, made in Lithgow. Uh, I've got these images from a uh, website, uh, Lawrence Ordnance. It's a gun dealer here in Australia. Had a chat to the owner, pretty nice bloke. He's um, agreed to let me um, use these images. So that was uh, pretty nice of him. He didn't have to do that. And I encourage you to have a look at his website. He sells a whole bunch of bayonets here in Australia. I think I bought a couple off him myself over the years. And um, he's got some pretty good ones, pretty cheap at the moment. So give him a quick look at, I would. 
like I think I just picked, or I'm about to pick up a um, Romanian AKM Type One off him for seventy five bucks, brand new, like unissued. The leather frog's perfect. Anyway, that aside, um, we've got our Lithgow bayonets here. So the very first um, Lithgow bayonets, the Ricasso has markings on both sides, obviously. So on one side, you'll have the pattern, date, and maker. So the pattern is obviously a P1907, but that's um, expressed with the Lithgow start with an A in the middle and a shield with 1907 and one beneath it. So that's the pattern mark. Below that, you'll have the year of manufacture, like uh, 1915 or whatever year it is, and it'll be the full year. It won't have a month included. And below that, it'll have Lithgow. That's the manufacturer. Now, as time goes on, I believe it was in 1922, uh, they started to change it up a little bit. And uh, the only thing that really changed was how they expressed the date. So they introduced uh, on the left side the month and on the right side they still had the full year being 1922. And then later that year they abbreviated it down to just 22. That was in line with uh, what the UK was doing with theirs. And uh, I'm not too sure exactly what year this happened. It was possibly 1926 or 1927. I've got a 1927 one here. But the pattern stamp changed from the shield with the Lithgow star to MA-1907-1. Now, MA is an acronym for uh, Machine Arms uh, Lithgow or Machine, Machine Armaments Lithgow. Uh, you'll hear a whole bunch of um, people claiming it stands for Mangravide or Made in Australia, but the most reliable source I've come across uh, says it's uh, Machine Armaments Australia. Or machine armaments, Lithgow, sorry, not straight. Now, it's not entirely uh, clear when, but sometime after 1927, the maker mark below the date was deleted. Sometime between 1927 and 1940, I'm not really sure when. Now, on the reverse of the Ricasso, the other side, are our proof and examiner's marks. So, in 1913, uh, there's a bit of a transition into the, the markings here, so I'll go through year by year, and hopefully that can help you out if you've got one of these, if you find it interesting. So 1913, we had what's called the Lithgow Star, which is a star with an A inside of it, either side of the Ricasso, and then in between that you have an X, which represents the uh, Ben Test, or passing the Ben Test. And below that we have uh, the um, L with a shield, sorry, the shield with an L in it. And uh, this was used all the way through until uh, 1921. Now, the early ones in 1913 had the stars upside down. Uh, that changed uh, late 1913. In uh, 1921, the um, shield with the L in it was removed and that was replaced with a Lithgow star and a broad arrow was put above that. And that was used all the way until uh, 1926. In 1926, they changed things up again. As I said, I've got a 1927 one here, so you can see what they changed it into. It's quite interesting, I think. Um, so what they did was instead of the two Lithgow stars either side, they removed those and uh, put in two MA stamps. Uh, as you remember, that's uh, Machine Armaments Lithgow. And then they had uh, more of a traditional, I'll bring this up so we can have a look, more of a traditional inspection mark. So you've got your broad arrow, your crown, have a look, a number and L for Lithgow. So these were used, uh, well that style was used for a number of years, but um, like the Lithgow um, maker mark, I don't know when they discontinued that. But by um, 1942, oh, if I can get this one out, this is really, really firm. By oh, 1941 at least, because this is a 41. They've changed it up again. They've uh, rotated the MA. Focus, please, from being vertical to horizontal. And then we just have, come on, focus, a inspection mark either side, or sorry, an inspection mark to the left and inspection mark above. If you've seen my other video, you're already aware of um, uh, the World War II style of markings. I've got one here just to show you. That's just our, our bend test. MA and a broad arrow, simple. I 
I probably should also mention, you get similar markings on your scabbards and your frogs. So this one here is a good example. Oh man, that's stuck. So this is uh, very typical of what you'll find on a lot of the um, the British scabbards. And this is what I was talking about where you have the um, military district number in between Department of Defense under the broad arrow. But something else you might come across every now and then is oh, get there. an Australian scabbard, except it'll have the stitching along the bottom and along the top. They're not particularly common. I'm trying to get my hands on one because I think they're cool. But that's something else that's um, pretty Australian. Like I understand there are a couple made in the UK as well, but um, they're they're pretty uh, pretty well uh, associated with um, Australian World War One bayonets as well, or interwar. Anyway, guys, that's sort of the uh, the best effort I have on these. Um, bit of a rambly video today, a bit of a longer one as well. I apologise for that, but um, thanks for watching. Um, if you have anything to add or I've made any grievous errors please feel free to comment below. A lot of the information I've come across is conflicting. I've tried to interpret it the best I can and use actual examples or actual markings on uh, bayonets to sort of uh, defeat <laughs> information that I can disprove, if you will. But um, if you know anything I've missed or any mistakes I've made, add below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.